listening to Inclusive AF with Jackie Clayton and Katie Van Horn. You go first. Oh my gosh. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Inclusive AF podcast. That's Katie Van Horn. <laughs> Are you trying to impersonate me right now by being all like yeah. cheerful and like, woo, here <laughs> yeah. we go. I love it when you do that. That's Jackie Clayton trying to Yo, impersonate me. Is that, is that <laughs> you trying to impersonate me? Eeyore? Are you? Yeah, I'm going to be the um, very subdued person at the beginning of the episode <laughs> this time, since you're usually the one. I got to like, you know, get you all fired up. Um, all right. Quickly, before you do anything else, all of our fabulous listeners, click like or subscribe or give us a rating. Join us so we can make sure, because as you noticed, we were on a little bit of a hiatus, but we we weren't. Don't talk about it. Just pretend it didn't happen. Just kidding. I mean, (laughs) we just want to make sure that you get every episode, all of which are (laughs) <laughs> well, no. Okay. Let's talk about it for a moment. Yes. We did take a hiatus, if you will. We didn't publish for two weeks in a row, yeah. but I think, um, it was a much needed pause mental health break. Yes. Because I think you and I had a few things going on and let's talk about those things well, before I- we dig in. <laughs> I'm sorry. I would like to start with miss Hannah banana. <laughs> yes. My daughter is in New York. We had to move her in. Fun. She is an, uh, what is it? Systems architect intern for Amazon in New York City. Took a little bit of time. I can't believe, keep in mind, this is the child who told me after every interview process that she had fouled it up and was not going to get it. I wonder where she gets that from. (laughs) Aunt Katie. (laughs) Yes, definitely me. Definitely me. (laughs) I really need to get better at my auntie skills. Um, (laughs) So yeah, she's working for AWS in New York city and um, is a rock star. She's got rock star status going on. And then sweet baby TJ graduated high school. Yes, he did. (laughs) He's a man. Um, the sweetest boy in the land, I guess. Yeah. We have to call him a man now. Like he's a graduate. No, we're calling him sweet baby TJ. Okay. I like that best until he gets so. married because his wife will kill us. So <laughs> there's that. Well, it's the whole idea of, you know, when you, when your son gets married, um, he takes on a new woman to take care of that kind of thing, but I think he's still ours until then. So that's absolutely right. Okay. <laughs> like just to be clear. And he's not allowed to get married until he's at least 45. So <laughs> it's going to work out perfectly for all of us. Everyone's a winner. <laughs> um, interesting fact about that, which I think is cool. So he's majoring in education with a minor in physics because he loves physics. But part of the reason he decided to go this route is they have Apple has a full scholarship looking specifically for black men going into education. Wowzers trousers. That's awesome. Yes. In, in, and it was very like a full, uh, like it was a huge scholarship and equipment and what we're seeing, it makes so much sense. We always are talking about representation and there's a lot, you know, there needs to be black men in education. There's not enough. And I think it's great as people are like, what do we do? How do we do this? And it's like, well, we'll just go directly to the source and make it possible. So that's wonderful. My son's going to be going to um, uh, Houston Tillotson and HBCU down there in Austin. And I'm just really excited for him to take the challenge to um, a vow of poverty for the rest of his life. Yes, that is very, very generous of him. And I am sorry that I can never not giggle when you tell me <laughs> Houston Tillotson in Austin. I know. I'm like, still doesn't make sense, but. Sure. We're going to go with it today. Um, so yes, good stuff all around, um, for the Clayton family. So very, very exciting. Mine was not as exciting though. My little, um, hiatus, it was kind of a work and family break for me. Um, work has been popping and going well. Um, but there's just work to do to actually, you know, make sure everybody's good to go. And then just some, you know, 
family stuff that wasn't so fun, but we're powering through. We're going to make it work. Absolutely. Um, okay. So I want to talk about what you just mentioned though. So, you know, I, I've had this conversation. I think this has come up and I've seen a couple like posts about it on Facebook is when was the first time you had a teacher that was a person of color? I've never had a teacher that was a person of color. No, wait, nope. Not even in college. I think I have had some teachers, but it would have been, I don't know. I think, <laughs> let me say this. My <laughs> Spanish teacher in my freshman year of high school, Senora Larios, <laughs> I don't know that she was Hispanic herself. I think she married into, she married a man who was Hispanic. Um, and my sophomore year, my high school teacher, again, uh, Spanish instructor, um, she was Hispanic, but I have never had a, a black teacher. Um, I've been in conferences and like learning environments where there have been um, people with disabilities who are like, whether they're confined to a um, wheelchair, things along those lines. But yeah, I, the instructor led situations there has not been. So I'm so glad that Apple created that. Like that's huge. Right. No. And I've never, and when I saw that, I got really sad about it. And then it also made sense hindsight that there was a woman, uh, a black woman teacher in Carrollton where I grew up that used to uh, invite me to her class and let me grade her papers and hang out with her. And hindsight, it was probably one of those moments. I literally, um, lived in an environment when I was, when I, where I was like two black people, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so I just, I remember this is how lack uh, um, of diversity it was when I moved to this town. Another black couple moved in or a black family moved in down the street and we knocked on the door and they were like, yay, black people. And we became like best friends. <laughs> like our families did lots of stuff together. Amazing. But That's that is awesome. just really a, a lack of, of people. And it's interesting because it's like, where do you go for those examples and what the examples that you, you set? And mm -hmm. I'm so, I am glad for Apple to do that. Um, mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, so my son, because uh, we live in Waco, his, the past principal, there's a lot of black men teachers mm -hmm. and um, he's only had black men principals since he's been in, in high school. And that's all he's known as a high school principal. And um, one thing that has always been so great is that Hannah's principal um, went into a different role when she left, but he always said, where's my daughter? Her, where's my daughter? Um, and I saw him at a school board meeting and it was so nice. He still was like, where's my daughter? Tell her to come back and see me when she comes back. And it's just so great. That's awesome. But I also like, I, I'm glad you just shared that last piece about TJ and like what instructors he's had, what teachers he has had, because it's the whole concept of, Hey, you can see it. You can be it. it um, worked. now he's yeah, like, Oh, it you works. Know what? I'm going to be a teacher. Right. Right. That's amazing. So, um, we are going to talk about something else, not just Jackie's family, because we love them and they're fascinating. Um, but we are going to talk about, do, 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 um, the most recent executive order by President Biden. Um, and basically the, <laughs> I would say it's the, the, um, return to, uh, logic executive order would be my take on it. Um, so let's talk about it. What are we I, talking about, Jackie? I think it's great. So President Biden signed an executive order advancing diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility in the federal government, which is a big switch because not only did we not know if people were going to be interested in diversity and inclusion, we didn't know if we were going to like go to jail for mm -hmm. the diversity right. and inclusion. Right. Um, and it is an executive order, but 
it, one of the things that he was really wanting to do was make sure that it represented like his within the federal government that it actually reflected the full diversity of the American people, which mm-hmm. is like why have we never done that, done that before? Like right. And 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 here's the thing. I know that it was it's not exactly, but it was kind of modeled after Obama's take on, you know, on the same executive Correct. order. But I do this went way further, as you're mentioning, like talking about the, you know, accessibility piece and talking about some of these other things, talking about they're going to do a pay equity review. Yes. And the piece that I really like thought stood out or the part that I should, all of it was amazing, but like, I think it's so good that they're also looking at pay equity and looking at leveling of folks. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, you and I have talked about this a little bit before that, you know, if you look at the rank and file of the military, you have a great proportion of females, you have a great proportion of uh, people of color, but once you start looking up the officer ranks, it dissipates quickly. And there aren't, you know, every general we see speaking about different things or whomever, it's usually a white male. Absolutely. And so having the, that visibility and having the, let's reflect on this and, and find out why, I just like that we're looking at it and talking about it. Well, and something else, I, I just pulled it up on whitehouse.gov, but mm-hmm. it says, this is interesting and comprehensive. So it says, the initiative will advance opportunity for communities that have historically faced employment discrimination and professional barriers, including people of color, women, first-generation professionals and immigrants, individuals with disabilities, LGBTQ plus individuals, and then it adds, Americans who live in rural areas, older Americans who face age discrimination when seeking employment, parents and caregivers who face employment barriers, people of faith who require religious accommodations at work, individuals who are formerly incarcerated, and veterans and military spouses. Oh, okay. Like uh, wowzers. <laughs> and a partridge in a pear tree. In a pear tree. But I, I, even that last one of like the spouses, I think that's a group that so often gets overlooked. And the caregivers. And the caregivers. And, and I actually was looking at some caregiver policies because I, I don't know, like we have, as most folks know, in the US, we do not have benefits for having a baby that are paid by the government, which is like, we're one of I think like four countries and the other three are not great examples of successful environments for humans. Um, but like we're <laughs> one of four that does not pay for maternity leave. And in speaking about that, like, it's also just thinking now, you know, there's a group in um, DC and I'm going to forget the name of them off the top of my head, but they're really focused on a family leave policy, which is so relevant right now for so many people where it's um, now we have to talk about our parents that we may need to be caregivers for the parents to get them to appointments, all these different things. Um, and then also, um, you know, looking at grandparents that are taking care of kids or like just those different family dynamics that haven't been thought of before and how a family leave could be so impactful. Um, so I love that they, in this executive order are doing the same thing, like really thinking about like holistically, who do we need to be talking about? That's who right. do we need to be thinking about? So that is awesome. Um, Speaking of which, did you hear the clip from uh, General Milley around critical race theory? So this is one that's been floating around on all of social media. And it's basically this 95 star general. I don't know what it is. I don't know. Three million stars. He has like three million stars. They brought a separate kind of a big deal. Yeah. Yeah, kind of a big deal. But, you know, he's talking about the fact that, you know, This is something that is critical for anyone in a military role to know the real history of the U.S. and understand some of the dynamics going into a military career, like how critical that is for them to know why some of these things are happening or why people feel a certain way. And so the fact that he was defending it was like, well, yeah, we just look at facts. And I'm like... (laughs) exactly the point. And that's that, you know, the, the whole fight against it is like the, I don't understand why that would not be something you want to speak about or why that would not be something that you would 
want to know and know your like have your kids know as well. So, anyways. Well, no, it just goes to show like literally they used to do this stuff in the back room, mm-hmm. but they literally are trying to keep people stupid or mm-hmm. keep people ignorant. Right. That's what's so bizarre. Mm-hmm. Like when he was like, Yeah, I read Karl Marx, doesn't make me a communist, right? Like <laughs> at the same time we already know that we're behind in other places like p.s you can't have it both ways you can't not educate your people not teach them about the real history not give the advancements like in math and technology hate immigrants and bring people from other countries to you know take on that extra burden because of all of the things that we don't do you don't get it both ways so which is it yes and you can't be that powerhouse of, you know, America first, America's the best thing ever. If your people are dumb, right? Or, I shouldn't even I say dumb, like, misinformed. Should we, send this to him? should we send this to people? Because it, it seems, you know, so easy. Yeah, I have. <laughs> so I have a parent that is a connection on Facebook and she is very much like, critical race theory is the worst thing that could ever happen. And, and it, it, like, I, it's kind of how I felt when Trump was in office. Like, I just wanted to like, help me understand what your logic is in supporting him. And I want to reach out to her and ask her, like, help me understand why you don't support your children knowing history. I, I just, I don't, under, and I know they're like, oh, it makes, you know, the victim, oh, you know, it does this, that it makes people feel badly. And I'm like, you know, I read about, you know, how we decimated indigenous populations when I was in school. And I also read Laura Ingalls and, you know, the, uh, what's it called? Little House, House on the Prairie. Prairie. Thank you. Um, and, you know, and had that view. And like, I think the, If you read about something, like, I love that he said, you know, I have read Marx. I'm not a communist. Like educating people actually helps them to make informed decisions. Turns out. Turns out like, and I mean, I read everything. Like I was reading very probably inappropriate things when I was young. And it's because I was like an avid reader and my parents were both teachers and encouraged reading. And so, you know, I mean, I remember reading like John Jake's North and South which is a historical fiction novel. It's like one of those like 9,000 pages. Um, And it was very much that like, oh, well, the black man is less than, and that's why they're enslaved. And now looking at that, I'm like, oof, yeah. Like how misinformed this book was. And for the time, I mean, I think he wrote them in like the sixties, like that was the belief system though. And so it's more of a, so many of the belief systems that we've grown up with are so like to look at them now, you're like, oof, this is not okay. I mean, but I think it's also like, I mean, any document from the United States historically has been like, there's a little cringiness to it at times. And I don't know why people can't just go. Yeah. We, we were misinformed. We didn't know enough or we didn't, you know, think well, about this in this way. This is the thing why it's important. Why I think it's, us being on this is the is is important in sharing different pieces because we always knew that wasn't us right as black people we knew that it was like bs and we knew that we the people wasn't for us we knew this country wasn't built for us like we knew that we were like stuck here and we you know it's like the what are you doing where are you going to go what are you going to do and this is how people were perceived around the world what is so detrimental and I think what we've seen is a result of people learning I always say they teach us black people to hate us Mm -hmm. going up through the ranks and so it's not even it's not even that it isn't being taught it is why do we still have to pass these stories down to make sure that they actually exist to tell people that these things why are we all trying to act like I mean and they don't understand critical race theory. It's about an open dialogue. It's not about, look at that. I you, I love our YouTube fans. Sorry about all of 
but you're used to it by now. Yeah. Sorry, YouTube fans. Olive did want to make an appearance today. She's <laughs> crying at my feet. So I had to pick her up um, and now I'm covered in fur. So it's working out, but yes, I agree with you. <laughs> like, I just don't understand why we would want to ignore that or pretend it didn't happen or pretend that we haven't systematically built everything in our country off of the idea of the have and have nots or the, you know, whatever you want to call it. And it's funny to also look at other. So this is one of the things that always fascinates me. You know, I like to travel internationally. And one of the things that's always fascinating to me is when I'm traveling with people. And I think I've even probably talked about this on the show before. And you have folks that are in a different country and are like, we're so much better than they are. And we're superior in our whatever. And then you're like, well, are we like, cause there's those <laughs> things like, I'll rem- like one of them and I won't name the country, but in one country, like the, the trash was out in the road and got picked up when it got picked up, but you know, there wasn't a, a great infrastructure around garbage collection. And one of the women that we met in this journey was like, oh, it's so gross, blah, blah. And I was like, you do know that this happens in the U S too. And like, we have this type of issue and also have they never been to Manhattan? It happens every right. day. <laughs> well, and that's what I was also thinking is, and also it's like controlled by certain groups in certain cities that maybe aren't the best examples of people. But anyways, like it's those types of things just always like, how are you this blind? How are you just this ignorant, I guess I should say to like what's going on in the rest of the world and how we actually, (laughs) I mean, we have kids in cages, so don't go to another country and be like, oh, we're so superior. And you are, our education is so bad. Like you can't even, it's almost like, oh, well, everybody has to learn English. Everybody has to learn English because the people in the United States are like refuse to acknowledge other countries and, and take those things on. Like, I, I, getting back to Millie, I love when he, you know, trying to ignore things. And I was thinking when we said that, that I would have loved to pretend like January 6th didn't happen, but we, we have to. And one of the things he said, he was like, I would like to understand white rage. He's like, I'm white. I'd like to understand white rage. I'd like to know why all of these people like stormed the Capitol and tried to go against the U.S. Constitution. Right. I would right. like to know why that is. If it does spark white rage, well, I guess I need to know why that happened. Yes. Since the people tried to attack the building, I was like, "Ooh, you go. Where did he go? Where did he come from?" Can you come be all of our friends? Because we really appreciate what you would have you to like say, to sir. Come to dinner. Sir? Would you like to you be our friends? Um. So, you know, I know we've talked about like acronyms before, but I, this is actually, you know, reading the executive order, going back to that. Um, I am also like, I want to add a, to the language yes. that I use. I want to add okay. accessibility. And, you know, I know we've talked about like how many different letters and all these different things, but I also think there's such a, a component that is forgotten, which is the accessibility piece and how are we more accessible? How do we make sure I mean, you know, you and I are very, or we try to be thoughtful about the fact like having a transcript transcript of each of our episodes. So folks can read if they are not able to, to listen. Um, And so I think it it is just, it's fascinating to see that on there, but I also am so excited about it that we're actually acknowledging some of these things that we, again, have not acknowledged in the past or haven't thought of in the past, other than when there has been some sort of effort to go, yeah, we need to pass the ADA. We need to look at, you know, some of these different accessibility things. It's just fascinating. I mean, it, it's, it's fascinating, but it's just sad. I, I will like to say, I like, I've been really happy and excited to still see that there is some momentum still going through all of that. Um, you're seeing people wanting to know, being excited, trying to learn. And every month as we acknowledge different groups every month, continue to keep, you know, promoting and looking back and doing that. So I'm glad that he took the time to have a thoughtful executive order on this Mm -hmm. and didn't just do it in the first 10 days because I forgot all of those, but there were a lot, 
right? Yeah, absolutely. But, <laughs> but now was a, a, a good time to bring that back um, because we have the time to look at it and absorb this. And it wasn't like all of the, you know, other things that happened. Yeah. And I think there is like, I am always excited when I start to hear, like, I, I'm going to talk about the federal government as a company, but you know, when you have companies that are actually looking at this from the right lens of, you know, how do we break down those systems that we've put in order? How do we break down the way that we have been, you know, doing this work? And one of the other things that came up in the EO was unpaid internships. Mm -hmm. That's something that the federal government has used for years and years, but talking about that and how do we instead do some sort of partnerships to, you know, however they want to do it and however they're going to come up with the solution. But, you know, this is something I think you and I've talked about before around unpaid internships, like the folks that it is hurting the most are folks that don't have the housing or the transportation or some of these other things that they can't go, okay, yeah, I'm going to go live in San Francisco for three months and work at this internship unpaid. Like, it doesn't work. It's not practical and it doesn't help anyone, but it especially doesn't help anyone that doesn't have the resources to support um, an unpaid situation. So that's another one that's kind of making me happy. There's a lot of pieces in here. There's a lot of pieces. I think, I mean, I guess I'm glad that I kind of forgot about, I remember when Trump said, that we they weren't going to have diversity and inclusion it was just a really bad day for us as we were looking at that day and and people it wasn't just a bad day like we were scared mm -hmm. we were just scared like what does this mean for us or as a as a country that is supposed to be open to accepting people from all these other countries and then we don't want to talk about it right well, and I think the other piece is just the, you just said it, you know, just about the education and how do we get away, you know, get better as a country and how do we also continue moving forward as a nation? Um, there's just this other piece that's like the, we can't just ignore all of these people that are a part of our country and just go, yeah, they don't exist. We don't care about them. We're not talking to them. And I know that like, if you talk to folks on the right and if you ask them, oh, do you just not like black people? Do you just not like Muslims? Whatever, whatever you can say. And of course they're like, no, no, no. I, you know, I, I don't dislike them. They're great. Whatever. Well, most people are. Um, but then there's like, but, but you're putting together all these things and supporting this legislation and doing all these things that are harmful to folks. And it just is, it's always so fascinating to me. Um, I think also they did a lot that we talk about because they said, this is what you need to do within the next hundred days. There were a lot of things that we talked about within best practices on how to get this done that they're actually implementing. Mm -hmm. Maybe he was in my keynote. I'm just saying. Yeah, maybe <laughs> that's, yeah. He was like, Jackie, what do you have to say on this? And, and then he's like, like let me I'm write busy. my EO. Here's a recording. Um, a recording you can take a moment and listen to. <laughs> yeah. And then come back to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, to be fair, we do share best practices. These are best practices. Right. I know there's somebody who's looking at this who are like, oh, wow. literally, this is what we've been, most diversity professionals have been trying to do for the past ever, ever, especially the past year and a half. Right. Well, and to your point on the, you know, the fear factor, I think anyone who was in this line of work, it was almost the, like, we were, we had such good momentum going in now, like, is every yes. company go, well, the federal government said we don't have to do it. So we're not going to do it either. And I would also like just to applaud. And I know that there's so much work to be done, but I do want to just like pause and say for those companies that continued forward and went, yeah, we're not going to follow the, the federal government on this. We're going to do what we need to do and do what's right and do what's good for business. And so I think that that is also just something to be commending folks for is that they didn't slow down. They went, no, 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 we're doing this. And, you know, yes, I know there's a ton of work to do. And I know there's a ton of folks that need to go faster, 
at least folks are keeping it yes. front of mind and that's what it's all about in my mind. So at the time, that's what gave us hope. Right. Oh, like it is a country of the people. Like you can be like legit. No, you can't come into my house. No. Cool. Right. So glad for the executive order. Glad that we are talking about these things. Um, what is the one like from, from the executive order or from this conversation? I, you know, we always do the, what's the one thing, what is the one, um, learning or what is the one thing that you're like, gosh, every company should do this or, or this is what I want to make sure folks saw or heard Add accessibility to your DEI statement. Awesome. I'm yes. going to change my job title right now. Immediately. Like, um, Yes. And then I would also say my thing would be, please go read the executive order because we know this is going to be twisted. We know this is going to be turned into something that it is not. Um, and I am sure that the media is already, you know, describing in their own words that aren't accurate what this executive order means or doesn't mean. Yes. So go read it yourself, please. And thank you. <laughs> So we're going to start with, this is a quick one, but um, thank you for listening. This is the Inclusive AF Podcast. My name is Katie Van Horn. And I'm Jackie Clayton. Bye-bye.